Hi, everybody. Uh, Hello. Hello. So tonight, of course, we have our amazing Raul de la Sota and Markdown, March 19th, Jeremy Chu. That'll be our next lecture, a brilliant graphic designer. But I do want to thank you all for being here now. And of course, here, here we are at our spring semester's um, series of artist talks. This is our second for the spring. My name is Laurel Paley, and I'm the chair of Visual Media Arts. Our previous chair, Alex Wiesenfeld, is here, and Daniel Marlos, our vice chair, isn't, but he's floating around somewhere. And I hope you're all following our VAMA um, feed, our Instagram, and our Facebook. Anybody glance at our VAMA feed? Anybody? A couple of social media people out there, okay. Um, how many of you heard about this from, from an email or from the feed? From Instagram, great. How many of us? Great. We have a new new email blast that we're, we're testing, so this is our first one. How many of you heard it from your professors? Good. I, I, I always want to know, and how many of you, it's your first time at one of our lectures? All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So um, as we get started, I just want to thank a few people first. <laughs> Elizabeth Prager and Alice Wiesenfeld and Tarina Williams. And um, the other faculty and staff members of Visual Media Arts, we, we work hard to bring this to you, and I know they work extremely hard. Um, this, this program is funded in part by the LA City College Foundation, and our student assistant, Ian Roberts, did the graphic design for it. So when you see these posters, thank you, Ian. Um, I am very excited to have Raul de la Sota here to speak tonight. He's a groundbreaking LA-based Chicano artist and a distinguished emeritus professor from right here. He has deep roots in Los Angeles and deep roots at LA City College. Actually, probably even in this room sometimes. Oh, I'm very much yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He had his, his AA degree from right here at LACC. Woo, represent. He has his bachelor's and master's from UCLA. Awesome place, go Bruins. And he taught here at LSU College from 1967 to 1996 as a full-time professor, and then stayed on and kept teaching for us until um, 2016. Um, he was the gallery director for many years here at LSU College. When we moved back into our building that's being renovated, we will bring back the gallery, but for many years it was his baby. And he also has continued to curate throughout Los Angeles and in other locations California, including at LA, LAX, the, the airport, Barnstall Municipal Art Gallery, and you might even tell us about other things that might be coming up. He spent 47 years having solo exhibitions in between <laughs> here, Peru, Mexico, etc. Um, of course, in the US, he has had 49 years of group exhibitions and 52 years of lectures, travel programs, and related events. So he has a deep and powerful history. Um, so this, um, you know, I should have brought a Kleenex, so I'm probably going to cry, but this is like a real commitment. This commitment to his art and vision, it's commitment to his community, which includes all of us. It's a commitment to the future of art, you know, this nebulous thing that is so meaningful to so many of us and his commitment to students and their education. So I went to his 50-year um, retrospective at El Camino College Art Gallery. I'm jealous that it wasn't here. But okay, <laughs> we're under renovation. I can't be too jealous. But um, in fact, he is so committed to his students that he includes in his own retrospective. There was a, a room off to the side that featured work by his former students who are themselves contemporary artists. Um, how many people? carve off a piece of their own retrospective to feature their students. That is commitment. He has a grand vision and a powerful vision about what art is and its place in society and what art can be. Um, you should all look up his TEDx talk, Why Art Matters, if you Google it. And he's had Metro, LA Metro commissions. Um, he's widely reviewed and published. I probably could go on and on and on. I have another Please. half a page. I think I'm going to. I just want to touch on um, a long time and deep commitment or involvement with Avenue 50 Art Gallery. Um, a whole bunch of exhibitions and 
Spain and traveling shows throughout California. Uh, an amazing show called Culture, Culture and Cultura, how the U.S. and Mexican War shaped the West at the Autry Museum. He's been shown in museums all over um, California and um, Europe. His work is in, in the book, in the book, the, the huge monumental two volume series about Chicano and Chicana artists published by American, um, sorry, Arizona State University Press, a bilingual book. Um, so I am personally, I know we are wowed by your contribution, not only to here, but to the art world, to Los Angeles, and to the development of hundreds and probably thousands of voices that have followed you and will carry on your vision. So now, on behalf of the Visual Media Arts Department, on behalf of Los Angeles City College, we want to welcome you back, Randall Delisso. I couldn't breathe. 
I have vivid memories, I still have vivid memories of my mother driving me in the middle of the night to the hospital so that they could do something to make me breathe, have me breathe correctly. So what I did was spend all my time indoors, in my room, drawing, painting. And I became so enamored with that because it pictured for me, as through my eyes, the world. I drew anything I wanted to, my imagination, and so forth, because the world was not kind to me outside. So while it was a bad thing, it turned out to be that which then forged my career. And the other thing that came of that is that in order to, let's say, have me breathe clean air, my mother would drive me and my grandmother to Yosemite, to the desert, to various places where there was clean air. And that's where I fell in love with landscape. It was not going to be people that I was going to picture for the rest of my life. It was going to be the earth. It was going to be the world. Because you realize then it was a matter of life and death. Landscape gave me life. You know, that outdoors, that, that nature was so valuable. Then the other terrible thing that happened was that when I was ready to graduate from, uh, from uh, John Marshall High School, I said, oh, I'm all set and so forth. And we had talks with the counselor and I said, well, I can hardly wait to get to UCLA. He said, UCLA? You've never taken a math class. <laughs> Ooh, okay, I'm sorry. You're gonna have to go to LACC. <laughs> you know, that changed my life. That changed my life. Because I realized that not only LACC was preparing me, but it had the greatest teachers who were so dedicated. They just made art so exciting, so important, that I sailed afterwards Transferring to UCLA, I sailed through that real fast, you know, graduated and so forth with honors, etc. And then given awards to travel to Peru as a Fulbright scholar and things like that. So these terrible things that happened to me turned out to be great things. So what is this love that I have for landscape? It comes from that. And I'm known always as this person who deals with the world in some way. It starts with drawings, you know, oil pastel drawings of the land. And later on, it turns because I realize that fabric has a texture that drawing does not. And so I deal dealing with fabric collages to depict the earth just gave me such a satisfaction because it's nothing that you necessarily can plan out. It's what's, what's available, you know? And I had scraps and all sorts of different things and I kind of put them together. So you kind of play with the idea of inventing, not so much just seeing what your eyes see, but really inventing. And of course, later, it becomes much easier when my friends see what I'm doing and they bring bags of <laughs> remnants <laughs> for me, you know, all sorts of collage and things. But, you know, these are the things that are the challenges to, to any artist. But eventually, what I find is that I want to picture something else, something a little bit more important. And this is where my heritage comes in. Because, first of all, English is my second language. I grew up speaking Spanish. And my, grand, my grandmother, I grew up with her, spoke Spanish, spoke some English, but nevertheless, you know, there was that play. And she would uh, regale me with stories.
stories where she was from, from the mountains of Chihuahua. She belonged to the Tarahumara tribe. And uh, there were all sorts of beliefs, all sorts of legends and things like this. And we just fascinated. So what I started to do is to realize that I have to come up with symbols. And you know, artists, many of you I'm sure are artists and art students, you know that you're always working with symbols. You're hardly ever working with a real thing. When you picture a figure, it's a symbol of a figure. It's not a deep thing. And so what symbol do you choose? You know, and so I started to deal with symbols that somehow the iconography of it described the country of Mexico to me. I chose cactus simply because the northern part of Mexico is a lot of desert and my family is from there. And so I started to deal in some way with cactus as a symbol not just for the country, but for the people. You see, this is, this is a, a print that's the, it's called the Four Seasons of Humanity. See, it's the young cactus, maturity, old age, and so forth. We get a lot of wrinkles in old age. <laughs> so, all of these things were starting to become stories for me stories and history. I did this particular painting as a almost a sarcastic comment. There is Columbus pointing out and saying, I discovered the new world. Now, oh, and by the way, there's a gigantic sculpture behind it in the boards from the original people that were there. So what do you discover? You discover that people were already there. So uh, in this in this sense, I began to talk about history. And when I talk about history, it is <coughs> history that has to do with the Spanish coming to the New World. And when the Spanish came, they had their own culture, and it was a good culture. Okay. But the mixture didn't quite work. They had to have the new world for themselves. So a lot of destruction, just like when the settlers came west through the United States, there was a lot of destruction of the cultures there. So a lot of my work when dealing with this was about the change. But then I decided to step a little further into a personal story. My grandmother's. My grandmother came to the United States walking from Chihuahua, the northern state, and it was through the desert, and it was during the Mexican Revolution. And I decided to choose a very famous painting by one of the famous uh, Mexican um, artists, Orozco, to, in, to do it in three-dimensional, because I wanted to change it. I wanted to emphasize certain things. The rugged, angular kind of power, and not just a nice frame thing. And my grandmother coming north crossed that desert, and she was carrying my mother, she was pregnant with my mother at the time, and she also had my uncle, who was three years old at the time. And I used another famous painting uh, by Siqueiros, another uh, Mexican uh, master. And this one really, to me, talked about her voyage, her journey to this new country. Um, she was fortunate in finding along the way a train junction, the engineer of a train saying, you look terrible, please come up and be with me up in the locomotive and we'll ride the rest of the way in the train. So she did that. She arrived at the, 
at the border, and I remember, you know, we're talking about days today when, when there's a lot of difficulty with immigration and things like this. And she tells me, she remembers very well, he let me off, I walked to the border, and I gave the border two cents, and he let me in. Mm -hmm. Two pennies. Mm -hmm. The border itself, to me, indicated this clash of cultures, such as, here again, the cactus. And if you look carefully, there is a fence there. And behind it, the sky almost suggests the stars and stripes. So we're looking at, therefore, this, this border, this barrier, in a sense, okay, for, for many people. I decided also to document our family history in this, what is called a codex, a manuscript, an illustrated manuscript. And basically, it starts with Columbus and then the savage, uh, you know, war, destruction of the, the Spanish and the uh, natives, the uh, introduction of the new. Uh, Catholicism, new religions, then the Mexican Revolution, and then up right in there, there is the desert with my grandmother as a little figure walking across, and finally we arrive in the United States, and we see that it's a journey almost of a snake that has traveled all the time. Uh, these things uh, historically just kind of interests me, but not stopping there, I decided to then talk about the stories that she told me, that she filled me about the legends and what was the beliefs and the, what was in the sky. You know, what was that? So many of the large paintings that I eventually ended up doing had to do with this land-sky kind of relationship where the land has a very definite, shall we say, um, translation because this mountain in Mexico is called the Sleeping Woman and you can see why, okay? But up above are all these other worlds, these levels of beliefs, these levels of stories that I was going to, in future paintings, start to illustrate. Here is that mountain, well, no, this one is Popocatépetl. This is the volcano in, in Mexico, erupting. But up above is the Milky Way, is the moon, are the constellations, are the figures that all these ancient peoples believed in. And they believed in them because it gave kind of a, a solidity to their history. It wasn't just blank. There were things to believe in. And it was so interesting to be able to try to put these together in a, in a picture. There is one uh, story that particularly, uh, really, I really liked. And that was the story of creation told by the Mayan people. The Mayan people of Central America and so forth, of Mexico as well. And it's funny that, just happens to be, yesterday I was in front of second graders talking about this, talking about the creation story, because it was a, a, a school that has readers come in once a year, and I was chosen as one of those people, and I. And I talked about this creation story. And they were very excited. Unfortunately, there were a lot of questions that I had difficulty answering, like, where are the dinosaurs? <laughs> and uh, what about Adam, Adam and Eve? Did they live over here? And, well, okay. I made up some good, good answers. <laughs> the creation of the world was an amazing thing. The land came up, rose above from the, from the ocean. All of these various figures and so forth that people believed in that 
were created in order to bring life to the earth. Um, and it's just, it has fascinated me for so long. Here again I have a cactus. This one is a maguey, or agave, some people call it. And if you've ever noticed in a great big gray cactus maguey with these huge, huge blades, has anybody ever noticed that they carry the image of where they came from? On the blade is the image of the leaf that peeled off. And that's the new one. And that's kind of what I, I dealt with there. Because to me, it was the history of, the, of that cactus. It was the history of that plant. And also, in a sense, it was the spirits. The spirits that live in that plant. And you know, when, when you're an artist, boy, you you get to do all sorts of neat things with your imagination. <laughs> the nopal cactus. The nopal cactus that is eaten, that is, uh, gives fruit. You know, it's a very valuable kind of cactus. And there it is, growing on this earth and silhouetted by the Milky Way, which, is, which was so important to so many people. You know, the, the people in, the, the, uh, in, in Alaska, the Inuit people, they believe that the Milky Way was created by wolves chasing bears and kicking up the snow, mm -hmm. throwing it high into the sky. Mm -hmm. These are fascinating stories to me because, my goodness, you begin to picture them. You know, you really start to picture all those things. Mountain. Cactus, sky, and again, always the Milky Way to me. Because the ancient people believed that the Milky Way was the road. Uh, in Spain, there is a very famous pilgrimage road that's called the Road to Santiago. My wife and I walked it. Now she walked on it. 488 miles across Spain. I didn't finish the last hundred. I was I was busy. Is that what I say? <laughs> um, but but the point is is that they call that road Via Lactica, the Milky Road. And why? Because the road parallels the Milky Way over your head. And at night you can see the Milky Way is directing you towards your brain. Mm -hmm. oh, pretty, pretty neat stuff that comes from all those ideas and, and beliefs. The whole idea of life and death, you know, becomes something that can help but be involved in history. The cycle, you know, on the famous festival, and then come on the festival, the celebration of the Day of the Dead. You're not celebrating the dead, you're celebrating the lives, the life, you see. And so these down here are various people in forms of the cemetery. And at the same time, they realize that those spirits can move back and forth during that time. They come down to earth. And whether you believe it or not, my wife has had some very strong sensations about that in various times in her life. <clears throat> the whole idea of the cosmos, and this is, I'll, I'll put in a kind of a little ad here because the one thing that's coming up in my history, in my art thing, is uh, that I think that I'm going to be putting together a show on cosmic ideas, cosmic pictures, images at the Southwest Museum in Highland Park. How they're going to plan it, when they're going to plan it, and so forth. But there is always that quality, and I know seven other artists that are very, very much involved 
with, with that. Now, there is one interesting thing here, and again, it, it, I find it fascinating just talking and talking and talking and over and over again. We see, const <coughs> we see constellations. Yeah, stars goes the star, and then the stars, and so on. You see the constellations. But there are many people in the world of different ethnicities. The Navajo, okay, and the Inca. They believe in the blackness, not the stars. This figure, this figure right here, you see it because when I was in Peru, somebody said, hey, look up there and see it. Oh, yeah, it's the blackness between the Milky Way stars. And it's called the Black Yama. And when that Black Yama moves with the stars and its nose touches the horizon, it's time to plant. And it's always worked. Always. So, these things are, are fascinating, but at the same time, they have a, a, a seed in reality in people's lives. <laughs> they believe that there was a star that gave birth to the gods, to the people on earth. And this star, okay, is they, they saw it in the constellation of what they didn't know, but to us, the constellation of Orion. And it's a dark, reddish glow. And they realized it was something strange. Well, of course, it was a nebula. And the nebula, as you know, gives birth to stars. And they thought that it gave birth to life on Earth. And this, the, the cactus symbols of the people coming to Earth. I dug a little deeper into the philosophy, the beliefs, and so forth, and the aspects. Believe that uh, this was one world that we lived in, sure. And there was another world up above there, too. But there was a third world that was there. And it was called Miklan. And this world was where the souls went. And the souls just didn't go to heaven, you know, like in other beliefs, where you go through the clouds and there's a gate and thank you very much and I have a good life and goodbye. No, their, their underworld, their Milan, was made up of barriers. The soul had to pass these tests. And so I decided, well, that, that sounds neat. I'd like to, I'd like to see what that looks, you know. So here's the, here's the entrance to the underworld. And these people, or cactus, shall we say, uh, was, they were always, every soul, every soul was accompanied by a guide dog. This guide dog, whether or not it was a chihuahua or whether or not it was something else. <laughs> Nevertheless, the people believed that dogs had this sense of protection and also the, the guidance, talent. So then as you entered this world, there were terrible rivers you had to cross that had demons in them. So there is our our friend over here, the dog, the figure, and they're ready to cross. And they cross that, and there's another challenge because the icy plains wait for them. And these souls had to be strong to overcome these barriers. Then there were a place where the crushing mountains were. And you had to be very careful and to go through the mountains at just the right time before the rocks crushed you. I tell you, I had great fun doing these paintings because who's going to disprove me? <laughs> <laughs> I could make it up anything I wanted to. Then they came to the barrier of the thorns. 
and these great thorns punctured the skin of the, of the souls. And eventually, through all of these barriers, the souls with the guide dog helping them, telling them where to go, eventually get to the place of eternal rest. Eternal rest. What is that movie that came out a couple of years ago, Coco? What a wonderful film. That's exactly that. You know, it talked about that aspect, that belief. And I think that this one painting reflects pretty much my own philosophy. Because this was the philosophy of my grandmother. And the statement that I use in this painting comes from a poet king, Netsarwadi Koyoku, who lived previous to the Aztecs in the Valley of Mexico. And he would write these wonderful statements. And the statement here is that the obscurity of the night but serves to reveal the brilliance of the stars. You see, out of the blackness of something terrible, just like my life, comes the brilliance, comes the light, comes the positiveness. Um, let's see, did I pass one up? Yeah. Recently, immigration has been in the news, and I've had to deal with some of the ideas the border, the barriers, stopping people. No, we don't want you. And what happens to people? You know. Um, and again, my symbols, you know, symbol of the of the people as cactus. And you think about it, you know, cactus is very pretty. But it can harm you. But also, if you have the right cactus, it's very delicious. Very delicious. Very good. And you make great drinks out of cactus. <laughs> Wood sculpture. This I entitled, uh, Welcome to the USA. <clears throat> This was the room that Laurel was talking about, where I set aside a whole room for my students uh, because I wanted to show them. Because I'm not just, you know, it's me, you know, not a big deal. So I wanted to show them. Uh, there are three, three works here of former students. Um, that, that uh, image of me was made by students, my goodness, in the 70s or something. And uh, I happened to locate those students and they came to the opening of the show. It was so great. They hadn't even remembered that they made that. Uh, this is a Japanese artist that was a student and still is a good friend. And I'm going to use him in the, the show at the Southwest Museum. And uh, that's me uh, doing a TED Talk. On the, on the computer. This was the um, entrance to my show, and you can see that, that painting over there. There's an example of folk art, and this is my sculpture. And this particular sculpture is um, a family tree of my mother in law. She has the most interesting family tree. Yeah. Mine, I'm not so sure. But she, her was, had so many kids. You know, all the children and grandchildren and things like this. And she was really part of the land, Mexico, the corn. Here is another shot of the, the show. And uh, with all sorts of different things. Um, I've been very fortunate in my life that uh, because of teaching, you know, you get time off. Some people can't afford it. but. Every summer, I, I would travel. My wife and I would go to places 
you know, to South America, to Spain, Portugal, uh, Mexico, Central America, things like this. And, and it was wonderful because I, were, I was, in a sense, I was reconnecting, and she was too, reconnecting with our backgrounds. Another shot of various things in the show. This was almost one of the very first paintings I did as in Peru. And it's a painting of Lima, Lima, Peru, by the, by the ocean in Peru. And <clears throat> I was on a Fulbright scholarship at this particular time, and I was working with this professor uh, at the university in, in, uh, in Lima. And uh, he was encouraging me to, to do painting. And I said, I don't, I don't have a student. We have a small apartment and so forth. That's how I do it. And I remember having this painting cramped into our apartment when I'm working on it. I mean, we're talking about a six foot wide uh, painting. So all these kind of experiences are things that uh, you learn from. This was uh, uh, a painting collage combination. Gravel, cloth, painting that dealt with the road that my wife and I traveled in Spain. This is the pilgrimage road. While it's rough, there's always a wonderful horizon beckoning you forward, so you're not going to give up. No. There's another shot of uh, some other students, a couple of other students who uh, are really professional artists now on their own. <coughs> And most recently, as I said earlier, I've been working with collage. This was a scene I took a, a group of, uh, of people on a tour of uh, Chiapas, southernmost Mexico. And this river is the river border between Mexico and Guatemala. And it was so fascinating because the color of the river was the color of the trees. It was just beautiful, gorgeous. So, you know, I was doing all sorts of different uh, things with collage and drawing and painting at that time. Recently, too, the obsession with the cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> using, using the calavera, which is a, a very traditional form to indicate living people, not dead, living people and to put them in a situation where you imitate life as it were. Well, that's kind of what I did. So it's a big piece of wood with all sorts of pieces put together, and so I had great fun doing that. <laughs> and that, my friends, is the last picture that I have to tell you about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have had an a incredible life. I, hope, I, I wish every one of you to have a very similar life where you give of yourself you find the path that you are going to follow. And it's a path of love, because you need to love what you're doing, as I do. Talking about being an artist, oh, I could, I could go on and on talking about an artist. But there was something that my uncle once told me, and I think that that's correct. He said he does not believe in inspiration. And I thought about that. So wait a minute, how can you not believe in inspiration? You're inspired by a wonderful thing. No. He said, inspiration comes from outside. You have to look in. In. Because you will find the ideas. You will find the way and direction you have to go. Not looking outside. Not waiting for that beautiful sunset. But something that 
grows in you. And that core, I think, is what each of us have to find. Because that core will make us grow. I've had it. That's it. I'm done. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, really. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> you know what makes a good, because you, you can't listen to other people. What's good for you is good for you. That's all. And what makes you happy, looking at a work, and that work is good, it reached you in some way. I don't know the besides that, I don't know. <laughs> That's a hard question. Go ahead. Um, so I loved your sculpture, Welcome to the U.S. I thought that was a really powerful sculpture. Um, is that the only sculpture you've done? Have you done more sculpture? What made you jump from painting to sculpture? Um, I tend to, um, I'm terrible for collectors <laughs> because I change all the time. And they're saying, um, well, are you doing any canvas lately? I said, no, I'm doing rivers. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible because, and you know, I don't know, you know, but I know artists that stay in the same place for 30 years doing the same thing. And their collectors love it because that's what they collect. I couldn't take that. I couldn't stand it. I'd be bored with myself. But if you're making money, you know, that's that's a big thing for people. So did sculpture bore you then? What's that? So did sculpture bore you then? Is is the sculpture did the, did making sculpture bore you because you did one like one or two sculptures? Oh no! I mean, uh, I, that was that was <coughs> one sculpture. I've done so many uh -huh. welded sculptures, mm -hmm. large ones that you know off in museums and uh, wood sculptures and things like that. <coughs> I mean, it just what appeals to me at the time. Mm -hmm. I feel like getting my hands on something that I can manipulate, you know. And then the other times is my hand is tired, I'm just going to draw. <laughs> At least that's my excuse. <coughs> Somebody else? Yes. I don't have a question, but I have uh, an honor to have one of your paintings in my house. Do you remember me? Tell me. Oh, of course. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. Oh, great. And you have one? I have one of the pieces of four factors that represent the four seasons yeah. in here, but yeah. also the four faces in your life. So I always look at that and I always remember oh, you and Lady. And thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there's one happy customer. <laughs> I only want to ask if students aren't asking, so. Um, so you, you have also curated, you've also run galleries, you're also powerfully involved with Avenue 50. Can you talk a little bit about not just your art practice, but also how the one feeds the other side of you and, and how like that kind of involvement and that kind of um, participation in the world feeds back to the art. And do you have advice for any students here who might be interested in curatorial and, you know? That's another tough question because I've never really given it much thought, except that I grew up with very, very strong family connections, particularly with my grandmother. And she taught me the indigenous way of thinking. You don't keep things to yourself, you share. And when I started thinking about curating shows, that's exactly what I thought, is that I wanted to share that venue because they asked me, hey, can you show some work here at this, at this other gallery? I said, sure. Hey, I got some ideas for other works. And I would invite these people to show with me. Well, does that denigrate me? Does that make me less important? I don't care. But I want to share the possibility of somebody keen and looking at somebody else's work and saying, I love it, let's keep going, blah, blah, blah. And giving, giving students, basically, a heads up, you know, kind of a head start. 
As far as working with a gallery, this gallery, Avenue 50 in Highland Park, is a nonprofit. Now, nonprofit galleries are exactly that. They're not profit, not for profit. They're always fighting to see if they're going to keep from just closing down. And my job has been primarily over the last few years is to keep it alive by having shows of popular artists, of, of other people that I know, and they sell, and it keeps the gallery going. I have fundraisers where I ask 40 artists, would you, if I cut you a piece of wood, eight by eight inches, can you paint on it? And then we'll sell it for, who knows, $100 or something like that? And yeah, sure, why not? So we have fundraisers like that. And it brings people in. So I, I try to think of all sorts of things by which I can, you know, share with people the excitement of being in a show. And I think that that's basically my work at the gallery, Thanks. is to curate those things. Now, I'm, as I told you, I think before, I, I'm curating this show that I think is going to be at the Southwest Museum. And I don't know when, because I've got to talk with the auction people tomorrow to see when they want to um, have it. But once again, I have seven artists that I want to show, you know? And I just, I just love it. I just love sharing all of that stuff, you know, with them. Anybody else? Any other question? Yes. Um, being a Chicano artist, what challenges, challenges did you face in uh, approaching the gallery or the museum? Or like that? That, that is also a, a good question. And I have to tell you, one of the reasons that I didn't have as much trouble as others is I pass. Look at my skin color. You're not, you don't think I'm, you know, related to people from the mountains of Chihuahua or, you know, things like that. I have in my background Spanish, Basque, and Irish, as well as Mexican. So I just happen to be the light one. And that, unfortunately, many times makes a difference. Mm -hmm is that when you approach a gallery and you're not dressed correctly or if you speak with an accent or you don't look right, your skin color is off or whatever, that can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to admit it, but it's true. It's very true. So what really depends on is not only you, but your art. And your art has to speak as somebody said, universally. Because I can talk all day about, you know, well, I'm showing somebody here, this is a painting of Mexico and so forth, but look how the Milky Way. And then I think, well, you've seen the Milky Way, haven't you? Have you seen these creatures in there? And they start to see, you know, the connection between themselves and other people. And that's what you have to do. You have to work towards that universality. Otherwise, you find yourself into a tight corner. And how many people are going to understand you? Five, six. You want a hundred people to understand you. That's how I can answer. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. Your paintings about the dead souls of the gospel. They remind me of a lot of the stories that I've heard about Mexico, Mexican people going through the border. Were you thinking about that when you were painting? <clears throat> I haven't helped to, to think about that for the last 20 years because whenever I freely go back and forth taking art groups or I do think a lot about that as, as you saw in the last three or four pieces yeah. and those are recent those are in the last three years Anybody else? Yes. And you've traveled to so many different places and talked about your art in various countries around the world. How do you think, or I guess, how do you think uh, 
viewers differ? Are they all the same? Or do they have different concerns or questions? Well, that's a wonderful thing, is that they differ. You don't want everybody to think the same. Can you give an example? Well, let's see. Um, when I showed, um, when I showed paintings by the State Department, the, the State Department sponsored trip to Africa. And I was among a group of artists who showed work. And I happened to be in Spain at that time, and the show was in Morocco at one time, and I went over to see it. And I heard people's comments, and how what they saw was something that they believed in. Not, not so much what I believed when I made the work, but rather their own take on it. And that, to me, is so exciting because, again, universality. It touches people in different ways. And that's good. You don't want everybody to believe, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, since I don't believe in that story, never mind. No, of course not. You want them to make up their own story and, you know, see it in your work. Folks, thank you very much. I think we've